What do Fear, Halo and Half-Life have in common? They've all mastered the art of making you feel like the hunted instead of the hunter, thanks to some of the smartest enemy AI design in gaming history. For example, the original Fear introduced goal-oriented action planning, a system that lets enemies decide their own actions to achieve specific goals within the game environment. In this video, we'll explore what makes for a good AI in the game and based on that, we'll shape the AI for Project Veles. In the last devlog, we implemented motion matching for our main character's movement system. Today, we're tackling something I've been personally excited about, creating the first enemy and laying the groundwork for the enemy AI system that will bring it to life. Meanwhile, my partner in crime, Yulia, is working on player abilities and magic system for the game. Since we started developing Veles, Yulia and I were swapping files on USB drives, like we were in some underground game dev black market. Except instead of selling illegal substances, we were trading bugs and existential dread. It was weirdly romantic, but not very efficient. So before jumping into creating a heavy new system for the game, I set up Perforce for source control letting us submit changes to the cloud like real developers. No more exchanging code in a form of love letters. Or at least not as often. Now I was ready to start creating the first enemy for the game. One that will work within the general design for the whole project. For those new here, let me catch you up. Project Veles is set in a world where a catastrophic event has changed the meaning of death itself. Souls can no longer move on and are trapped among the living, causing pain and despair. Our protagonist, Veles, sees this tragedy firsthand, where the soul of his late wife is forced to linger in her rotting body. Driven by love, he performs a dangerous ritual to enter the land of the dead and restore the natural order of death. The land of the dead in Project Veles is structured like an abstract labyrinth, similar to Dante's vision of Inferno in The Divine Comedy. It is divided into multiple layers, each representing a different type of torment. And in the game, we want to represent each layer in a form of a dark and twisted fairy tale. The journey begins at the gates of the underworld and grows increasingly dangerous and surreal as Veles ventures towards the core. At the heart of this land lies the divine entity that controls the death itself, a being Veles must confront to restore balance. Throughout this journey, Veles encounters hostile souls, people who, in life, were criminals and sinners. These souls remain imprisoned in the land of the dead as punishment and cannot move on to the actual afterlife. But here is the catch. As the memory of them fades among the living, their humanity disappears with it. The less they are remembered, the more monstrous they become. It's a grim reflection on how memory shapes identity, even after death. The first enemy Veles faces is the guardian of the gates to the land of the dead. This menacing creature's sole purpose is to prevent the living from entering. Imagine a relentless sentinel bound to its duty by ancient rules. It is both terrifying and tragic in its existence. For Project Veles, before committing to full production, I'm focusing on what's called a vertical slice. Why? Because as an indie developer, creating the whole game upfront is risky. What if the core ideas do not land? A vertical slice lets me polish a playable segment of the game, test its mechanics, tone and the main gameplay loop, and decide if it's worth scaling up for production. Plus it's perfect for pitching to publishers, who, let's be honest, do not care about your 50-page design doc anymore. Yeah, we're all out. 
They want something they can see and play. It is also why I decided to use placeholder assets and tools like Mixamo for now. Hiring 3D artists and animator is expensive and I want to ensure the vertical slice is promising enough before bringing a team for custom work. And that's what I'll be focusing on for now. I found this model on Unreal Marketplace for $30 and it's close to what I envision for the final design. It has some interesting details, like a prosthetic sword for a hand, which is perfect for combat but probably makes some daily tasks, let's say, challenging. I mean, imagine trying to wipe your butt. W one wrong move and that's a situation nobody is recovering from. To create the enemy's behavior, I had two options. Behavior trees or state trees. Behavior trees are widely used in AAA games because they are modular, visually intuitive and easy to debug. They represent AI decisions as branching tree, where each node is a potential action that the enemy AI can take. This structure makes it incredibly flexible for complex behaviors. State trees, on the other hand, are newer to Unreal Engine and focus on state-driven logic. While less visually intuitive than behavior trees, they are more efficient for performance and can handle transitions and substates better. Plus, state trees aren't just for AI. They can also manage player mechanics, making them versatile. Designing AI systems like this requires a mix of creativity and structured problem solving. Skills that are invaluable, not just in game development, but in so many areas of life. And if you want to develop those skills, let me tell you about Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform designed to help you master problem solving through hands-on learning. With thousands of lessons in topics like math, programming, data analysis, and even AI, Brilliant focuses on teaching you by doing, not just watching lectures. Their method is proven to be six times more effective than passive learning because it keeps you engaged and thinking critically. For aspiring game developers, Brilliant's Python courses are a perfect way to start. They let you dive into coding right away, teaching you essentials like loops, variables and conditionals while building real programs through their drag and drop editor. By the end, you'll be ready to tackle your own projects and think like a Programmer. You can try Brilliant for free for a full 30 days by heading to brilliant.org slash rafalobrebski or scanning the QR code on the screen. Plus, the first 200 people to sign up using my link will get 20% off their annual premium subscription. Thank you Brilliant for sponsoring this video. For Project Veles, I chose state trees for their efficiency and versatility. While they are a bit harder to work with upfront, the performance gains and modularity are worth it for a game with intense combat systems. For example, using a state tree, my enemy can seamlessly transition from circling around the player to launching an attack without any delay. With the AI controller and state tree set up, it was time to make the Guardian stretch those dead bones and move around a bit. The model I purchased came with basic animations for attacks, walking, running and idle poses, but no strafing animations. Strafing is critical for creating dynamic combat. In games like Ghost of Tsushima, enemies circle the player creating tension and giving the combat a sense of life and unpredictability. It is also key for one-on-one -on -one fights, where enemies move strategically to exploit openings. Strafing makes an enemy feel smarter. Without it, they are just charging towards you like a drunk uncle at a wedding, trying to solve the situation with momentum and hope. To fix this, I turned to Mixamo for strafing animations. But here's where the chain of the character caused issues. It is permanently attached to the model, and when I rigged the Guardian in Mixamo, the chain decided that it wanted to start a solo career and started floating like it was auditioning for a low-budget paranormal documentary. 
Thankfully, Unreal's Layer Blend Per Pose came to the rescue. I blended Mixamo's strafing animation with the idle pose where the chain was held correctly. The result worked, but it's a workaround I'm not excited to repeat for every animation that needs cleaning up. And as I looked closer at the attack animations of the model I bought, it became clear that cleaning up would be needed quite often. You see, to create a good and challenging AI behavior, you need to have attack animations that have some movement in them, like the enemy lunging or stepping into the attacks. Such movement makes this character more warpable and allows you to create more dynamic combat. Most of the animations that came with the asset are way too static. The character is just standing in place when performing an attack, which makes it feel like a duel with a 90-year-old grandma. And obviously, while I do enjoy the occasional grandma duel in real life, those are the ones I usually end up winning, this wasn't the vibe I was going for. So I did what I always do when faced with a problem, ignored it and moved on. I snipped the chain from the model and decided to deal with it later. With the chain gone, I could finally use Mixamo to add proper attack animations and create more dynamic combat behaviors. I chose a few dynamic animations that worked well for the combat prototype. But Pixamo can only take me so far. Hiring an animator isn't in the budget, and since slavery is frowned upon these days, I had to get creative. Enter Move AI, a tool that turns your phone into a motion capture studio. Using Move AI to capture my own attack animations felt empowering. Until I remembered I am an almost 30 years old game developer and I'm one awkward move away from calling an ambulance. I might need to bribe a more athletic friend with pizza and vague promises of payment in the future to step for future mock-up sessions. But this is just the beginning. In the next devlog, I'll take my home mock-up studio to the next level and create better animations for The Guardian. I will also be covering other elements that make AI good, like enemy reactions, dynamic decision making or group behaviors. If you are enjoying this series so far, hit the like and subscribe for more. Now I want to hear from you. What's the smartest or the most frustrating enemy AI you've ever faced in the game? Let me know down in the comments. And see you in the next one. Bye.